Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the theater. For many of us, we unconsciously exist in the shadow of measurement, a mindset of evaluating ourselves based on arbitrary systems, either by the hierarchies of success, physical appearance, or the outright estimation of our worth in currency. And indeed, in a world where everything has a price, it seems only natural to wonder what ours might be. It appears undeniable that this way of thinking inhibits human flourishing, rather than bolsters it, or if it does not slow us down, it makes the process of self-actualization and of forging one's own destiny an endless race of acquiring, weighing differences, and constantly comparing oneself to others. In other words, misery. What could be done out of passion is instead achieved for the sake of status. What could be done out of love, instead in the name of fame. What substance we might have garnered in the journey is simultaneously robbed, leaving us to rediscover the meaning behind our actions retroactively, rather than enjoying them in the present. This leaves us with a peculiar question. Just what is the price of human life? Does it change, considering the objects we possess? Our list of achievements? Does it change, considering our merit in bettering society? What if we are loved, alone, criminals, or killers who have served their sentence? And who might we call upon to determine this value system? A collective of economists, philosophers, or both? Or is this question so ridden with moral landmines that we dare not touch its specifics, rather leave it sitting in the corner, unlit, with its details left in a forgiving shade of ambiguity? One thing remains certain, that the price of a human is much easier to determine after they've died. At least, this was the case in the 18th and early 19th century Britain, when cadavers were frequently sold by common people just like you and I. With the sciences flourishing, specifically in the study of human anatomy, there simply weren't enough bodies to go around. A law was passed to allow anatomists the corpses of executed criminals, but with this new deterrent, crime rates dropped, leaving less criminals to be studied in the first place. Consequently, the practice of selling corpses became so common that watchtowers were built around cemeteries. Families hired guards, even rented stone slabs until their loved ones had decayed enough so as to become useless to anatomists. Those who made a business of stealing bodies were given the name Resurrectionists. And despite the precautions, this very strange, very specific kind of crime flourished. But what if that process proved too unwieldy, but the reward for doing so too tempting to ignore? What if the demand were so high that all but begged for some cunning entrepreneur to create the product? And just how might they go about doing it? Few souls know this better than this episode's subjects. William Burke and William Hare, unbeknownst to them whose actions would become the horror of so many, their names would be solidified in history. And today, it is us who is unearthing their tombs. My name is Harlequin Grimm, and you are listening to the stories of monsters whose voices are lost in history. And this is Mania. Our story takes us to the sloping hills and low mountains of Edinburgh in 1827, to the tight crevices of Westport, to their steep, damp stairs leading to drab taverns and poorly lit alleyways. We find ourselves on an overcast day in October, where the rain and chill crept through William Burke's haphazard worn outfit. It had been nearly a decade since he abandoned his first wife and children in Ireland. A laborer by trade, Burke had little interest in intellectual communities or the sciences. For years, he'd worked on the Union Canal, but since the project had finished, he hopped from odd job to odd job. Though a cobbler at this time, he'd done everything from baking to hawking with his second wife, Helen McDougall, selling second-hand clothes to the impoverished. To the community, he was a good-natured, industrious worker 
seldom seen without his Bible, and a frequenter of Presbyterian meetings held in the bustling grass market, a humble laborer of good standing. But all that was about to change. When doing work for the harvest of a nearby county, Burke met a man by the name of William Hare. Illiterate, quarrelsome, and boasting a scarred face, Hare seemed to be the antithesis of Burke, and yet the two became fast companions, perhaps owing to the idea that Burke wasn't quite the front he put up. Both being in their early to mid-twenties, it's possible that Burke found an unlikely friend who helped him embrace a more mischievous, youthful nature. And Hare? Well, Hare found in Burke someone reliable, a sturdy connection in uncertain times, another pair of hands to join his in becoming the devil's playthings. Hare's wife, Margaret, ran a lodgings house near Westport. Beggars, vagrants, and the odd traveler were their target customer. Burke and his wife moved in after making Hare's acquaintance, but shortly after, his rosy reputation changed rather rapidly. The two couples became known for their boisterous behavior and heavy drinking. Margaret was no more graceful than her husband, just as uncouth and prone to debauchery as he, but it was Hare's wife who ran the business. After all, he'd only taken part in it recently. Margaret's first husband, the original proprietor, had died only two years before, and it was only two years before that Hare was merely another tenant before taking his place. It wasn't long before their carelessness caught up to the four of them. With Burke neglecting his usual trades and Hare spurring on his laziness, the two relied on what little income the lodging house produced to fund their day drinking. With their tenants being no more affluent, the odd little family was just scraping by. On the morning of November 29th, Margaret was looking over her ledgers on a table, scattered with used dishes and half-finished bottles of liquor. It appeared one of their tenants had come up short that month, owing four pounds of rent, no small sum in these times. The tenant in question was an old army pensioner, and when Margaret banged on his door to confront him, there was only silence in reply. After forcing her way in, expecting to find him in a deep, drunken slumber, she found instead his corpse. To her, the death was the least disturbing part about this. Without him being alive to collect his pension, there was no one to settle his debt. The task of taking care of the body fell on Hare, the no-good husband who, frankly, had nothing better to do. But this couldn't be done first, without bemoaning the late rent to his friend Burke, all the while tugging on his coat to help him with the grisly task. Four pounds short and he croaks just like this. Hare sighed. Can you believe it, Willie? Now standing in the room with him, staring at the problem in its foggy, crooked eyes, Burke's spine began to tingle. Something momentous was happening, though he couldn't quite put his finger on it. It was as though a light had just pierced through the window and warmed him from the inside out, banishing all his worries at once. And yet there was no light in the dingy room, let alone a window, and very little humanity or grace, and the corpse left by an impoverished old man. Get a herring barrel, Burke said with sudden excitement. A what? Hare asked. A herring barrel, and bark, a lot of it, from the tanners, but first alert the local parish. They'll provide a coffin free of cost. What's the barrel for, then? And the bark? What's that to do with this old stinking bastard? Hare stood in the doorway, a hand cupping his nose against the sour smell of urine. Burke had just finished inspecting the man's pockets, finding nothing. Without looking away from the corpse, a small grin played on his lips. I have a plan, he said. Just as he thought, the parish supplied the funds to have a carpenter outfit a coffin for the army pensioner and by that afternoon he had been placed in it, and a burial was scheduled the following morning. When night arrived, the work began. Burke and Hare pried off the nails in the coffin, and lacking all elegance, 
removed the body of the army pensioner from it, before stuffing him beneath the very bed where he died. Before resealing the coffin, they replaced his weight with heaps of bark and leather scraps from the local tanner. After the solemn burial of rubbish the following morning, attended by very few, mind you, the pair returned to the lodging house. In the cramped room, they worked out the stiffness from the corpse's limbs, twisting him this way and that until at last he could be stuffed into the herring barrel. Once they took to the streets in broad daylight, they looked only like another pair of laborers, rolling a barrel from one shop to the next. Arriving in Surgeon's Square, they were met by the assistant of a renowned Dr. Robert Knox, a surgeon whose anatomy lectures almost always sold out, cramming 400 spectators and students. Just a moment, gentlemen, the assistant said. Burke wiped some sweat off his brow and plopped a seat on top of the herring barrel. You don't think this is wrong, do you? Hare asked. Burke quirked an eyebrow. Well, he was four pounds short, wasn't he? We're just helping him pay his debts. He's already buried in any case, he said with a wink. Upon arriving, Dr. Knox only briefly inspected the corpse before leaving again. The anatomist was too focused on the enterprise of furthering scientific study to be selective with his purchases. The history of the body was immaterial to him. So long as the corpse was fresh, its journey from life to table may as well be just an inconvenience of time. After giving them seven pounds for the cadaver, the assistant strained out his waistcoat and said, We would be glad to see you again when you have another to dispose of. Outside the surgeon's square, Hare walked a bit lighter, for once bringing home good news and enough coin to earn his wife's approval. But Burke, well, Burke had another air about him entirely. A man renewed with determination, quieted by the overwhelming possibilities swirling in his mind. What do you think you meant by that? Hare asked. Meant by what? Burke replied. He said he would be glad to see us again, didn't he? Why do you expect to see us with another one? It's not as though that sort of thing happens every day, does it? I in a butcher's stall with heads, hooves, and tails on display. Burke murmured, Folks die every day, William. Suppose so, Hare said. Won't be long till we lose Joseph, I reckon. Who's Joseph? Burke asked. Some miller who came in a few weeks before. Awful sick he is, William said. Margaret says he's bad for business. That would depend on whose business he's for, wouldn't that? Burke replied. While he headed off to the nearest pub, Hare stood still for a moment, just then beginning to understand what his friend meant by the odd statement. The following month, the miller was still sickly, a detail which Margaret never failed to remind her husband of. After sharing a few drinks with Joseph to celebrate the new year, they carried him back to his room and, drunk and defenseless, Hare sat on his chest while Burke suffocated him with a pillow until his feeble thrashing ebbed, and at long last, they had yet another to induct into the cold walls of Robert Knox's operating suite. It's not murder, is it? Hare panted, still straddling the body. Burke tossed the pillow onto the bed. No, no, of course not. Miserable fellow, wasn't he? This was a mercy. Otherwise, he'd have died alone, coughing himself to death, eh? Hey, Hare replied. When candlelight stretched their flitting shadows, silent and brooding in the quiet hours just past midnight, over their newly acquired product, the weight of their actions did not wear heavily on Burke. From the earnings of the army pensioner, he'd bought himself a new wardrobe and he rather liked the way his clothes fit him. To Hare, they had just solved two problems simultaneously. Potential tenants wouldn't fear for the possibility of contracting an illness, and soon, both their pockets would weigh heavier for it. Seven pounds heavier, which in today's time comes out to around a thousand dollars. January laced its frosted fingers through Edinburgh. The nights grew long and dark, the morning chill, oppressive, difficult to beat out, while chimneys billowed smoke from crackling fires. The easier days of autumn's harvest were mere memory now, 
Such times made it easy for men like Burke and Hare, living from month to month, to consider the rich offerings attained far easier through darker paths. The luxuries of comfort awaited them, and all that needed quieting were those pesky morals, the virtues which made honest living hard and long hours of labor unforgiving. Those in their line of work couldn't stomach what they did. Grave robbers, sure. Sacrilegious, certainly. Profane, disturbing, without a doubt. But murder, even to a resurrectionist, murder was another thing entirely. The progression was natural, if you could call it that. First, the army pensioner, which had done the work for them. And then Joseph, sick enough to provide the excuse of being a threat to the business. Sick enough to beg the question if they were merely expediting the inevitable. But as the nights grew darker, so did their questions. In February of 1828, another pensioner and traveler, Abigail Simpson, passed through Westport. She'd stopped by in town to sell salt as a means of supplementing her pension, and lived not far from the city in a town called Gilmerton. It's dangerous, traveling alone at night, Hare had said to her at a nearby pub. Much safer, leaving after first light. Good news is, I have just the place for you to stay. But Abigail never saw first light. After they'd plied her with drink just as they'd done to Joseph, they smothered her in the early hours of morning before she woke. Her protests were short-lived, addled by sleep, too much drinking, and ended swiftly by what had become their customary technique, hair holding down the body while Burke suffocated the victim. A technique which earned its own name, Burking. When they delivered her that very same day to Surgeon's Square, this time in a tea chest, Dr. Knox was impressed by how fresh the cadaver was, so fresh that he felt compelled to murmur aloud that she was, in fact, still warm by the time she was delivered. And on account of this, Abigail fetched ten pounds instead of seven. After this sale, both McDougal and Hare's wife, Margaret, had become aware of the sudden influx of income coming from both their husbands. When their indiscretion came to a head, it wasn't met with shock, just as the perpetrators were. The wives were taken in by the preponderance of coin the corpses were fetching, and just like Dr. Knox, it hardly mattered to them just how they came about acquiring them, or in this instance, creating them outright. By spring, they were all in on it, thereby expanding their methods of luring in potential victims. As happenstance would have it, they became an odd little murderous family indeed. With winter relinquishing its hold, the warmer seasons would prove busy for their new business. And now, with two more sets of hands to help, the Burke and Hare families loosed themselves upon lodgers with abandon. A nameless English traveler from Cheshire fell ill with jaundice while staying at their lodgings. And as we all know by now, illness is not looked upon kindly by the Hare's place of hospitality which is precisely why they finished what Jaundice had started, delivering the poor fellow to Robert Knox before he even had a chance to recover. In April of that same season, Burke met two women in the Canongate area of Edinburgh, Mary Patterson and Janet Brown. He invited them over for breakfast at the lodging house, leading the pair with a bottle of whiskey in hand. But breakfast didn't turn out as simplistic as Burke had hoped. At one point, his wife accused him of cheating in front of the two guests. Now, this wasn't a terribly irrational accusation, considering that the two women were, in fact, prostitutes, and that Burke had, in fact, slept with one of them, namely Miss Brown. Now, being a murderer, it's safe to assume honesty wasn't terribly far beneath him, meaning that Burke denied the accusation, stating his opinion on the matter by throwing a glass at his wife resulting in a gash opening up just above her eye. With blood pouring out of her, this was understandably where Janet Brown drew the line, leaving the lodging house to get some fresh air. But with Miss Brown gone, that left Mary Patterson alone in a house of murderers and co-conspirators, a den of killers looking for their next easy sale. 
by the time Miss Brown returned, McDougall had patched her wound. The breakfast table had been cleared, and Burke was sitting quietly with the morning papers. It appeared in her absence that the tension, accusations, and fighting had settled themselves. Where's she gone? Miss Brown asked, concerning Miss Patterson. Burke hardly looked up from his reading. She's left, he stated, straightening out the papers to demonstrate that the matter had been settled. Left? Left where? Burke heaved a sigh. Well, she's gone back to Canongate, hasn't she? Left shortly after you'd returned, in fact. Now, this wasn't entirely false. Miss Patterson had left the lodging house just before Miss Brown had returned, though she did so in a tea chest, and not altogether, well, alive. And at that moment, her still warm corpse was being overlooked by Dr. Knox, who had been so thrilled with the young specimen that he decided to preserve her in whiskey and dissect her three months later. She fetched eight pounds. Summer came with brighter days, but Burke's nights only became more haunted by the memories of what he'd done. It's easy to paint killers as unthinking, unfeeling individuals, when in fact Burke drank heavily and even took opium at night, lest he lay awake for hours, staring into the abyss of souls whose lives he'd reaped. Summer also heralded the beginning of the end. To Burke, the impoverished were seen as expendable, and only of value once they had been murdered, so it's only fitting that one of their most destitute victims would prove to haunt their sprees until their final days. There was, in the streets of Edinburgh, a beggar who was very well known. Daft Jamie, he was called, on account of his deformed foot and the misfortune of being born with an intellectual disability. Jamie fell prey all the same, any doubts cast away by the two smiling couples, their amicable wives, the promise of a warm bed, and free drink to ease the day's tensions. But when Jamie was examined the following day, Dr. Knox knew something was amiss. Everyone in the town knew Jamie. The odd angle from which his ankle bone protruded, and even just his visage, were unforgettable features of someone who, despite his poverty, wasn't expected to die so young. Dr. Knox wouldn't risk preserving this body. This allowed the chance that others might see it and ask questions. He moved Jamie's dissection ahead of all the other cadavers in his possession, but before the public lecture took place, he removed both the boy's head as well as his deformed foot. But it wasn't Jamie which tied the noose around Burke's neck. There was another final murder. On the day of October 31st, 1828, concerning one Mrs. Dougherty. Claiming that his own mother was a relative, Burke lured the elderly woman into the lodging house. But there was one small problem. Another couple was staying the night, James and Anne Gray. Hare convinced them to stay somewhere else for the evening, after which point they smothered Mrs. Dougherty. Their impatience was their downfall. That following morning, Anne Gray returned to retrieve some stockings she had forgotten. Stockings that had been left in the room she intended to stay at. After being denied access, the Grays grew suspicious, and later that day, they returned when the lodging house was empty to find Mrs. Dougherty's body crammed beneath the bed where she had left her stockings. Before the police arrived, Burke and Hare removed the body, but an anonymous tip was one step ahead of them, leading the police to Dr. Knox's dissecting rooms, where they found her, identified by James Gray. It had been nearly a year since this business took off. There wasn't a shade of doubt to the authorities that the mind behind it was Burke, described as being steeped in hypocrisy and deceit, his collected and guarded demeanor, full of danger and guile, even a cool, calculating, callous, and unrelenting villain. Meanwhile, Hare was described as, well, at first look, seemingly an idiot. Despite Miss Dougherty's being identified, 
there actually was very little evidence to press against the two men. Medical experts could not determine the many victims' cause of death with any certainty. Dr. Knox had his own reputation at stake as well, and all the reasons in the world to deny suspicion, let alone his willful, blind eye to the frequency by which the bodies were delivered. In the end, it was Hare who pulled the final lever to Burke's demise. The court offered him to turn King's evidence, meaning, so long as he confessed to the details of the murders, he could trade Burke's place on the scaffold for his own freedom. The day of January 28th, 1829, was one of torrential rain. A dismal, dark day for Burke, his last day. Crowds were not unusual for executions. In fact, they were incredibly common. But this day saw between 20 and 25,000 people gathered, with window seats and balconies and tenements being rented out from prices, ranging from five shillings to one pound. As the noose was placed around his neck, Burke heard the words of Lord Advocate Sir William ringing in his ears. I trust, he said, that if it is ever customary to preserve skeletons, yours will be preserved, in order that posterity may keep in remembrance of your atrocious crimes. It felt surreal then just as it had felt surreal the many times he felt someone's life escape between his fingertips. And how odd it was that a man could make so easy a living doing something so careless as killing. It seemed distant to him, the fact that his fate would be so mirrored as his sixteen victims, pried open, dissected, observed by hundreds. When the trapdoor dropped and Burke's body plummeted. Do you think, in that moment, what they did to his body mattered to him at all? Thank you for joining me for another tale. What Burke certainly couldn't have expected was that his story would be rewritten and enjoyed by such a wonderful audience. Now, it's important to tell you which parts of his dealings were fabricated for dramatic effect and which were not. For killers such as these, I tend not to fictionalize any of the victims or the order by which things happen. I did my best to represent Burke's victims as they were described in various accounts and where they took place. The dialogue between the two men and any others in the story you might imagine were fictionalized. But the odd details with the tea chest and the herring barrels, well, some things are simply too strange to be imagined. It's important to note too that I didn't show you all 16 of the killings. Since his technique was the same each time, I thought it would get rather repetitive. So I picked the ones which I found most pertinent to his story as a devolving murderer. But Burke and Hare's relationship was, as far as I can tell, true to history. His partner's fate is actually largely unknown. After the execution, Hare traveled from town to town. He was virtually despised by everyone he encountered, and chased out by the locals of whatever place he was residing at. At one point, uh, authorities had to create a decoy with which to distract an angry mob while he escaped from a back door. It's interesting how out of their way they went to protect an actual killer after he had been given King's evidence. But whatever happened to Hare, it's safe to assume his life trajectory never quite recovered from these events. As I said, in total there were 16 confirmed killings, but there's some speculation that there were in fact several more. To this day, true to Lord Advocate William Ray's sentence, Burke's skeleton is on display in the Anatomical Museum of Edinburgh Medical School. There's even a book said to be bound with his tanned skin at Surgeon Hall's museum. <laughs> but to me, the theme of this story rings out in the motives of these men. Value. Price. 
the pressures of a society making otherwise good people consider unethical paths, the things we do to feel relevant, economically or otherwise, in a system which asks us to compete. I like to imagine that many of us are not far different from Burke. Though we may never commit the kinds of acts he did, we may turn our noses up at it, in fact, without taking the briefest moment to consider the paths which create such a person, never realizing that if we were but in their shoes, we may very well find ourselves making very similar decisions. Before I leave you, I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone who is listening to this show and let you know why there have been less stories like this one. And many months ago, I announced that I would be self-publishing a book on Halloween called The Black Carnival. But after the book's premise caught the eye of a few publishing agents, I realized the story deserved a shot in the traditional publishing markets. This book is the reason why Mania's Theater was quiet for several months, as I was feverishly writing and editing it. But now that I'm querying the novel, I have more time on my hands to dedicate to the show, which two years ago on Halloween was born. And I'm very pleased to say that Mania is brought to you by its listeners, those who share it with their friends and family, take a minute to rate it, or giving it the lifeblood necessary to continue. Better yet are my patrons, who are helping bring these stories to life in a very real way. If you would like to support Mania and my works, you would find yourself at patreon.com forward slash Harlequin Grimm. As always, the theater is ever open to you. This has been Harlequin Grimm, wishing you a very haunted Hollow's Eve.